Okay, so Malcolm, welcome back. We're glad you're safe, all right? Especially I am. And you know that we've spoken a couple times while you were over there, uh, like the last time here on Mea Culpa. I know you've been on the front line in Ukraine, and now you're back for a short time to promote your new book. They want to kill Americans. Now, the book comes out, if I'm not mistaken, this week. So congratulations. I know how hard it is to, to write a book. Uh, it was tough for me when I was in prison. The second one, I'm literally five pages from being finished with the Department of Just Injustice. And so for you, my friend, I say congratulations. It's amazing, by the way, and terrifying all at the same time. Now. Apparently, your skills in counterterrorism helped you predict the January 6th insurrection quite a while before it actually happened. And you mentioned that while America was relaxing after Biden's win, that you were on high alert, ready to spoil the party. Do me a favor. Explain. Tell, tell us a little bit about the book. Tell my listeners, um, you know, why uh, you felt this way, because it's something you and I spoke about on more than one occasion as I predicted right. Trump to do something two years before the January 6th insurrection. So you and I have always thought similar in this respect. Tell my listeners a little about the book and why. Well, you know, first, when I when I came up with the concept for this, it, it started in August 2020. And what I was doing is, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a firearms collector, I'm a tactical shooter, um, and I was reading forums and the, that were pretty mainstream forums, firearms forums, snipers forums, and there was a lot of real anger out there over the riots and that had taken place during the summer. But the real subculture that was happening was this modern, what they called modern patriot movement. And these were guys who were like, we need to arm and be ready for civil war. And they were using civil war openly like that. And as I analyzed it in the exact same way I would have analyzed Al Qaeda or ISIS, it became clear to me that there was this very small nucleus of people that wanted something to happen. And they were all Trump voters. They were all being egged on by Trump. Um, and that by the time the election had come around, I, I had actually made a prediction to one of my 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 uh, my literary agent. I said one of two things is going to happen. If Trump wins, these people will become the self-appointed armed enforcers of his will. You will see marches around the streets. You will see Trump parades with very open guns, intimidating society. I said if they lose even worse, they will become an insurgency. They will become essentially an underground that will take on a life of its own. They will elevate Trump to being their tribal leader, and they will bring war to the government of the United States. So right after the election, you know, which was November 4th or November 6th, I was on real time with Bill Maher. And Bill was, was doing like he usually does, being great. And uh, he goes, you know, we really need to try to bring these people in. The election's over, Trump's finished. You know, we need to try to understand where they come from. And, uh, you know, he says, enough doom and gloom. And I go, doom and gloom? You want doom and gloom? I'll bring you doom and gloom. We are heading it into an insurrection. So, or not an insurrection, insurgency. An insurgency is a series of what we saw on January 6th, a campaign over a long time. So I essentially predicted the January 6th insur insurrection 62 days early. <clears throat> what you're looking at now with this book is a prediction I made a year ago. A year ago, most of this book was finished. That QAnon would take over the Republican Party's core ideology, that's happened to the point where the party has no platform. The platform is simple, love of Trump. And now the followers of the ideology believe that liberals are evil and must be eliminated. Um, you know, the whole where we go one, where we go all, carry out insurrection and violence against the government, that, you know, all these crazy conspiracy theories. They used to be shunned. You couldn't wear a T-shirt, cute T-shirt for a long while at a Trump rally. Now they don't care. It is the heart of the Republican Party. And this book is a warning, not for just what happened in January 6th, 
because this book was started before January 6th. It's a warning about what's going to happen next year on January 6th and the following year. They are gaining strength. They truly believe they have the guns. And when I say they, you're probably thinking, who's they, Malcolm? Your neighbors. The people who voted for Donald Trump, the people who quietly are not going to tell you they voted for Donald Trump, the people who believe they have enough guns to intimidate politicians. And if they have to, like the guy said out in in, uh, Oregon, when are we going to start killing people? We have these guns. When are we going to do it? They're serious about it. And they are. I remember watching you on Bill Maher, and I remember that statement. Why can't we just bring them in? And let me, let me give you my opinion, because right? I was yelling at the television at the time. Um, it's because they don't want to be reeled in. And no matter how much logic that you provide, how much legitimacy that their ideology, their actions are all bad for this country, They don't care because they're right now, as you stated, they believe that they're in power. They are now empowered, these these backyard bullshit artists, right, that sit there shooting at targets, you know, in backyards and so on. Now, all of a sudden, they're empowered. We are a huge force, a paramilitary force. We're going to spend our last dollar on Kevlar and anything else that we're going to need. And we are going to take over. Now, what they don't realize is that they're taking it over for a man who is a self-proclaimed autocrat, wannabe, dictator, monarch, supreme leader. And that down the road, um, if in fact he ever became what he wants to become, the last thing that he would allow is anyone to have a gun because that would put him in danger. He wants only his people, his military. Now, some of them may end up joining into that into that group, but he would not want everybody walking around uh, the street with firearms because his biggest fear is exactly what just took place in, um, uh, in Japan with Shinzo Abe. It's... Ex- it's exactly his fear. Now, Trump's fear was not that somebody was going to shoot him. His fear was much more ridiculous. It was much less permanent that somebody would throw a pie at him or a tomato at him while he was speaking. That's the big fear that Donald uh, had that I've spoken about uh, quite often. Not worried about the illegal firearms or the legal firearms that people just choose to use. So your book is both fascinating and terrifying at the exact same time. Well, you know, I I really, all of my previous books, I've written nine other books, and or eight or nine, and I always try to end on an uplifting note. I really do, until I wrote this book. (laughs) Let me tell you. When I started writing the last chapter and I was struggling to find things that were positive to say about what's coming in the future, I struggled. And of course, I did the mandatory, yeah, we nearly need the vote. We need to mobilize our vote. And I decided about a third of the way through the last chapter, I wasn't going to end on a positive note. I was going to end on the exact words used by a policeman when he was out sitting in a police car and didn't realize that their recorders were going, right? And he was talking about hunting down blacks and killing them. Let's just kill them all, right? This was a policeman who had been with another cop for years planning mass murder based on the political situation. The political situation. We are as close to 1860 in the Civil War as we are ever going to get. I don't like to use the term Civil War. I use the phrase insurgency actually titled, you know, collectively, the Trump insurgency in the United States, T-I-T-U-S, Titus, right? Because they are an organization now. They've gone from being a bunch of rubes in the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. They see themselves as a body of humanity and as far as they're concerned humanity with guns is an armed force granted they're not skilled 
um, they don't have the, you know, the collective body of knowledge that you would need. But I think they really see themselves to a certain extent as, a, you know, a good old boys with guns, which means that the average liberal isn't going to be able to defend himself. I've heard that phrase a hundred times. Uh, we have all the guns. I've seen that written thousands of times on the Internet, on these gun forms. We have all the guns. They don't know the difference between this weapon and that weapon. And when you do, the first thing they do is they jump on the Internet and try to cut you down. Right. Oh, you don't you don't wear your body armor. Right. And crazy stuff. I mean, I got that all this week coming out of out of Ukraine. And here's the kicker. These are people who are buying non-bulletproof helmets and dressing up like they're, you know, special forces and weighing 300 pounds and they want to use the guns. There is no reason for them to own these instruments if they don't have the ability to go out and exercise their power. And there is a, a bloodlust that starts when you've seen your handiwork when you smell the cordite out of your gun. And I think quite a bit of them, even Donald Trump, I suspect that if he saw people actually killing people in his name and getting away with it, like Kyle Rittenhouse, I think even he would change his well, mind. Look, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not forget he had Kyle Rittenhouse at mar a you no. know, on more than one occasion and so on. So I'm not so sure that it would change. Only if it was his ass that was in the line of fire. And I'll tell you, like, like what you're referring to, I had the same thing when I was testifying the hate mail that I used to get. One individual was a retired uh, officer out of, I believe it was Ohio, uh, from a small town out of Ohio. And it's those people that's, that make me nervous because these are people who have tactical training. They're people who have spent many, many years investigating crimes and trying to figure out the best way to perpetuate one without getting caught, right? right. I mean, that's what, right? So, you know, um, he's, he's become like a teacher. And so, of course, I turned that over to Secret Service. Uh, as of this day, I still have no idea whatever happened, you know, to that investigation, um, other than to say they probably knocked on his door, you know, so doesn't make me sleep any better at night. But I, let me ask you this, Malcolm. You say in your book that American fascists had their real coming out uh, at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville and that their aim was to show the world that we had a serious fascist army here that would overthrow the government to defend the white race. Mm -hmm. But once Charlottesville was so widely condemned, these guys seemingly disappeared. But in fact, they really didn't no. explain where they went and tell us about, you know, you started about Titus. Um, explain that, if you would, to my listeners right. so that they fully understand what's going on here and the danger. Yeah, this is fascinating, fascinating, because a lot of people really don't understand what happened after Charlottesville. You know, it was the public shaming of them as acting like Nazis, looking like Nazis, dressing like Nazis. The police, when all these riots and fights were happening, the police refused to intervene. And in their mind, that was acceptance of what they had done. Then it went to the president of the United States, and he went with this. There's very fine people on both sides. Therefore, they are fine people. Instead of disappearing, what they did was they changed their skin to a certain extent. They changed their, 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 their camouflage. And they became open, public, brazen Trump supporters. And the only difference is you didn't see their guns for about a year. And then when the, you know, the George Floyd uh, protests started all around the United States, that's when you started seeing groups of people. And I don't mean just the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers or the, or the Order or the Three Percenters. You started seeing masses of civilians in their hundreds. Good example, Louisville, Kentucky. There was a pro George Floyd protest and suddenly over a hundred armed people in camouflage with helmets, with weapons, showed up to counter protest, walking in the streets with arms. And when I saw that one, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. This isn't the usual suspects. 
This is an entire swath of their society. Who are they? And what they are was they are a conglomeration of all of those people, the neo-Nazis, the, the pro-South secessionists, the, the three percenters, the Oath Keepers, average citizens who owned guns, who wanted to support Trump. And the way that you became a Trump supporter was to be an open protester, armed protester against the George Floyd protest. So by the end of 2020 summer, these people were showing up everywhere. And that's when I was like, whoa, wait a minute. This is this is way beyond small groups. This is a social movement which requires you and you listen to you go on the, the forums requires you to own an AR-15. If you want to be a patriot, you have to own an AR-15, body armor, multiple magazines, helmets, tactical gear, which is why when everyone showed up on January 6th, the only thing they were missing was their long rifles, right? Their main yeah. arms. And they, these are people who had a lot of them in their cars in Northern Virginia. Quite possibly yeah, I don't thousands think, of guns. Yeah, Malcolm, I don't think people realize the extent of the size of this group. I mean, you know, these self-identified, you know, members, um, you know, come in various forms, right? In different groups, these neo-Confederates, you see them running right. around with the old Confederate flag, right? With Trump's name written over it, neo-fascists, white nationalists you got you know let's never forget about the clan because you know they're they're there and the neo-nazis uh as well and the crazy part about this whole thing is they're not shy which is what your book um discloses they are not shy to revert back to symbols of the past that are exactly what they are intended they are racist anti-Semitic, anti-Islamic, you know, they are anti-everything other than white nationalism. And it's very, very, it's very scary. I mean, all you have to do is just look um, at some of the old photos of that Unite the Right rally with swastikas and the old Confederate flag. And then you had, you know, a whole slew of various symbols, not to mention Trump 2020, right? Uh, MAGA flags, you know, all being worn. And congratulations, I guess, to Donald and to his campaign for making his motto, right, to make his flag as part of the same alt-right, neo-Nazi, anti-Semitic, anti-Islamic um, organization. I mean, congratulations to him. I'm sure his family and, you know, and future generations will be very proud of him. Look, he loves this. Look, you know him personally. This is all about adoration. To him, to his, to his ego, his narcissism must be fed. And this is where it becomes very dangerous. A couple of scenarios play out in my head. What if Donald Trump dies of a freaking heart attack? One cheeseburger, two men. He dies. And in a, a, a natural cause. These people will not believe it. They won't believe it. This will be on par. You know, I, somebody was talking to me today. They were like, well, we're in upstate New York. What can we worry about? And I go, this guy lived in Beacon, right? Art, artsy little town up there on mm -hmm. the Hudson. I go, did you have any MAGA truck rallies come through your downtown? And he goes, yeah, we had it at least twice. I said, imagine that with AR-15s. Right. And now it's not a rally. It's an oppression operation to impose their armed will against you or to protest your presence by shooting you. And then what happens if you have some towns, some counties, even governorships, state legislatures that will approve it, approve of armed bands coming and taking the governor's house or the uh, the, um, the the the, the gov you know, the uh, state capital. What if that happens in five, six, seven different states where federal authority is now renounced by the governor and these armed crowds? That is rebellion. That's civil war. Now, that you know, they could start looting the National Guard armories. 
in one scenario that I put in that book, which was about a mass murder by right wing groups using advanced technology. The first thing that my imaginary president in the United States does is he orders the Secretary of Defense to have an immediate inventory of every weapon in every National Guard armory in the United States, because what if they're stealing weapons? What if there are people that are sympathetic? Look, do we have to wait for the mass murder? Do we have to wait for this to be prepared? The only way you're going to be forearmed is to be forewarned. And I made this book. The book is scary. I tell you, I've read it now since like, when you write a book, you don't really know what you've written. And when you read it, you go, holy cow, this thing is really a hot item. But it's a story that's all reality. And interestingly, I ended my, um, the new audio version of the book. It has an epilogue that's not in the print version, right? But the print version will last with you longer because you can see the words, you can absorb the words. Eventually get the audio version. And there's an epilogue where I'm going through all of my equipment in Ukraine, you know, Ops Corps ballistic helmet, earmuffs, you know, body armor, you know, level three A, frag grenade pouches, all this stuff. And then I say, there were people in this nation who dressed with the exact same thing, not to defend democracy in Ukraine, but to overthrow American democracy on January 6th. And that's where we are. We have these two pillars of, of, of people, one righteous and trying to save democracy by defending with their lives, which is what I'm trying to do. And the other one, people who would rather see you, Michael, and me, Malcolm, dead on the streets or hung from a lamppost. And they, as they put it in their neo-Nazi uh, day of the noose. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, let's not forget. Um, we've seen this already. And mm. as we all know, history repeats itself. You, I mean, how do we forget so quickly when um, there was the attempted kidnapping and the storming um, of the Michigan uh, governor's uh, mansion and so on with, um, with Governor Whitmer? I mean, this is exactly the same thing that you're talking about. This is a group of self-proclaimed militia that wants that wants what they want they want to change it by force and listen by like force. i said your book is by force your book is both um fascinating and terrifying at the same time now you equate the recent rise in mass shootings obviously as terrorism but are these 20 something year old maniacs really just like an arm of trump's army right i mean do you see them seeing themselves that way as vigilantes for Trump. And at the end of the day, what's their goal? I mean, just to scare the hell out of the rest of us? Or is there a more organized and perhaps sinister idea behind it all? For example, like what you just said, a race war, a civil war. What's your opinion on this? You know, if Timothy McVeigh were alive today and carry out the Oklahoma City building attack, there would be a good chance he wouldn't be convicted in court, right? The Michigan plotters you just talked about got acquitted because their lawyers convinced the, the jury that the FBI informant who recorded all their, they actually said those things. That stuff's all recorded and was presented in trial. Um, but they got them to believe that, that, um, that the trial was a setup right? The whole trial was a setup. So by getting away with that, they've managed to actually set the pace. Kyle Rittenhouse is another one. But all mm -hmm. of these mass shootings are based on one man, Anders Bering Brevik from Norway, the guy who went to a liberal day camp, summer camp, and mass murdered 68 children and their supervising adults and wrote it all down in manifestos and put pictures out on the internet, live stream. All of this was designed to harness the imagination of the new white, young white supremacists who may actually have confused loyalties. One minute he might be talking about liberalism, the next minute he might be talking about smoking hash, 
And then the next minute, he may be a Trump supporter, like this last guy with the Trump you know, flag around his neck. But one thing that they all have in common, they are all white, right? Or even like the last guy, you know, a, a non-white Hispanic who views himself within that pantheon. The leader of the Proud Boys is mixed race, but they view themselves as part of that cause. And Anders Bering Brevik set the pace. Then a guy did it in, in Canada, mass murdering people at a mosque while live streaming it. Then another white guy came and did it in, uh, you know, in, in, in El Paso, Texas, mass murdering Mexican. Then a guy in Poway, New York, and the guy in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They are all universally have the same traits because they mimic Anders Bering Brevik, who wrote, I killed these children. And he bragged about it at his trial. He would like, he dressed as a cop. And would go, oh, come here, I'm here, I'm part of the rescue party. And when they would come, he'd take his M14 rifle and shoot him in the head. Children under the age of 14. And he laughed about it. And he said, I was here to eliminate the next generation of liberals in Norway. And he challenged all young white men to be part of this global collective to cleanse the world of liberalism. Well, you know, when they say liberalism, they're really talking about blacks, Hispanics, women and Jews. That's what they're saying. And they and most of them say it out loud. Blacks, Hispanic, women and Jews, Muslims. Right. That's what they view it as. He has created this world, this fantasy world where young white men can sacrifice themselves. Oh, by the way, never get killed by cops. They always surrender right and they can become honored amongst the white supre supremacist world and like isis and al-qaeda a lot of these guys think that when the big race war starts they're going to get sprung from jail man oh man oh man you know one of the biggest problems that we have in, th in this specific case it was a hung jury and it was a hung jury in many respects for the same reason why so many of these prosecutors are afraid to go after Trump himself. Right. Because there is still a group, 24, 26, 28%, whatever the actual number is. I've heard di you know, divergent numbers. But whatever the number is, there's a better than likely chance that one of the people on that jury is going to be a Trump supporter. They don't give two shits about reality. They don't care that the feds were doing a sting operation as these three individuals were talking about you know, um, kidnapping, you know, breaking in and kidnapping the governor uh, and then executing her. They didn't, it, to them, this was just locker room talk as Melania, you yeah. know, had said about Donald with, uh, you know, grabbing women by, the, by their crotches. It's all the same thing. So all you need is that one holdout and you're going to have a hung jury and it's going to, this is a problem. And you know, one of the things that we do on Mea Culpa is I'm trying to turn Mea Culpa into much more than just a podcast, but rather a movement because you hit the nail right on the head. It's not just a civil war, a black white issue. They hate black people. Okay. It's not just that they hate Jews, they hate, they hate us the same way that they hate black people. They hate Muslims. Why? Because they're not Southern White Christian Coalition. They're not part of their group of white, national, white nationalism, white pride, white privilege, um, Christianity. They're not. And you start to see this as it's a, it's a real danger. Um, we are the melting pot. And so there are obviously many different groups. And my recommendation is that while they want to slowly gather, you know, their groups of like, what, 25, 30, 40, these bunch of, you know, jerk offs that spend every last dollar that they have on beer and bullets, that's okay. You take us as a collective group, we're much bigger and we're much stronger than they are. And while, of course, we rely as Americans on our police force uh and i would say at the same time our 
you know, our military in order to subvert these behaviors, these actions, these, you know, traitorous actions. Um, I still think we have to ensure that we have each other's backs because what happened in Charlottesville was just a test run. It's very much it's very much like what I constantly say about the January 6th insurrection. It was a test run by Trump and Trumpism for others to mimic down the road next time. Who knows? Maybe they'll be successful. But it was certainly a test run. I suspect that where you're going to see that test run play out is a state like Florida, where you have DeSantis, who really wants to be considered the smart Trump, right? The calculating Trump, who is going to take Florida and turn it into whatever he thinks, uh, you know, an right wing extremist world should be. And he's cynical. He's just doing it for politics. But, you know, guys like that, they, they, you know, they view well, whoever backs them up, whoever is still funding their pockets, you know, the Sheldon Edelmans who go out and give a hundred million dollars straight up cash, right, to these causes, which liberal, by the way, liberal billionaires don't do that. They give virtually no money, right? They'll give it to a presidential campaign, but they will not take a hundred million dollars. They'll take a hundred thousand dollars. So you're already outgunned by one man, 1,000 to one. And they will buy the extremists. They will create a right-wing information sphere, as you know. Yeah, but Malcolm, my point here is it's not about money, right? Money is not, I don't give a shit how much money Sheldon Adelson, who unfortunately is now, well, you know, is deceased. uh, It makes no difference, you know, how much money gets thrown at these individuals in these organizations it doesn't it really doesn't matter right it's this is not about money this is more about ideology yeah. and about the fact that their ideology is so warped as a direct result of a man the 45th president of the United States who wanted to be king who is willing to allow these people to do the worst possible things imaginable so long as it's in his name. I cannot tell you the number of people who have come to me and said, it is impossible. Trump cannot possibly be an anti-Semite. His grandkids are are Jewish. Um, Ivanka converted. And I say to them, as if he gives a shit, in order to actually care about being an anti-Semite or um, an Islamophobe, You have to care about your own religion. And anyone that believes that Trump has a religious bone in his body that he could, you know, name a single scripture is a fool. And that's what's happening here. His bullshit is empowering these groups to act in a way that is illegal. It's immoral and it's un-American. But so long, in his opinion, as it's being done on his behalf, Fuck it. So be it. Right now. Let me ask you. Let me ask you one last thing here. Right. Because obviously we're talking about gun violence. And obviously speaking of gun violence, the GOP refuses to stop. I mean, it kills their kids, too. Am I not right about that? They just they they can't just see their children who get killed during these random violence um, acts as collateral damage. Right. Or can they are Republicans purposely rewriting the Constitution and amassing weapons as a way to control liberals and Jews and, you know, and blacks and everyone else that they hate? Well, they're amassing weapons because what Donald Trump has done, further to your last point, is that he has managed to harness all of their inner hatreds and make them normal. Not just normal, jokingly, laughingly acceptable amongst all the guys, right? And any time you get caught being racist or anti-Semitic or insulting Hillary Clinton or, you know, wishing death upon somebody, you just go, oh, it's a joke. I'm just a clown, ha, 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 right? Um, He understands the power of those words. But more than that, he understands that he, with every fault, that he has everything about him 
He has been anointed and appointed the tribe's chief. He is a tribal chieftain, like a Somali warlord. So it doesn't matter how many women you rape or who you kill or who you behead. So long as you are acceptable to that tribe as their pinnacle leader, you will do whatever to keep that tribe happy. This tribe is, it turns out the Washington Post did a study, 65% upper middle class white men, business owners, CEOs. They want to be violent. They want a United States in which they are the dominant society. And technically they'd like to take it back to what the framers were, right? Rich landowning white guys who cut women, blacks, and the Indians completely out of the American picture. But the founding fathers understood as they had enlightenment values. And they understood this was going to change and make America better. These people want to eliminate, Thomas Rick said it great, best, the, the great military analyst. He said there is a body of white Americans in this country who would rather um, destroy America than see America being anything other than what they want America to be. And I'm paraphrasing, but it's terrifying. They do. I, look, I spent my entire life defending this country. My great, great grandfather, when he ran away from slavery, helped forward the American dream. My grandfather in World War I, my father in World War II, we served this nation to make America better and to harness those better angels. They want to kill those angels. And when I say they, I'm talking about your neighbor. I'm talking about the guy that's your UPS driver, your policeman. And they are a diverse body, but they have one thing in common. Donald Trump is their chi tribal chief. And the chief doesn't have to say a word. They will figure out what he wants. And if that involves mass murder, they will do it. Yes, but for him at the moment... What it really, what he really wants is their money to the tune yeah. of another $250 million, which again, it, it befuddles me. The fact that you have two seconds after another crazy nonsensical thing goes on. For example, uh, the bipartisan gun uh, legislation, all of a sudden within a split second, you're getting three to four Donald Trump pack, um, you know, text messages and emails. Friend, we are once again under assault. I mean, and the language that they use, you are not under assault. You are the assaulter, right? You are the guy who's basically asking people who don't have money, Mr. Mega Billionaire, to send their money. And they don't start it like a dollar like a normal politician or somebody, they're starting off $75. The next level up, $150, right? Then it's $300, $700, $1,500. There's only five boxes to choose from. And sadly, these people who don't have the money to give are actually giving it. And even those that do have the money to give, they know that they shouldn't be giving the money, but they're doing it for whatever reason, I can't figure out. And when I said that you get three, four, five of these, then you get Don Jr. jumping in. My God, this is a kid who I've known really well. I don't know what the fuck happened to him, Malcolm. I don't know whether, you know, he he's on something that's messing with his brain, with the chemistry of his brain, but this isn't how the guy thought. Yeah, he was always into his firearms and knives and hunting. I get that. But now what he's promoting, my dad is under attack. You know, we as, a, as the GOP, the Republicans, the true Americans, we are under assault. And you shake your head and you say, okay, first of all, I know you didn't write it, right? Uh, but why would you ever allow anyone right, to use your name in that type of an advertisement. For God's sakes, your father's already shit up this country. Your name, Donald J. Trump Jr., is like having the name Adolf Hitler Jr. It's like having, you know, um, a John Wilkes Booth Jr. These are names that, good luck getting, unless you're in Palm Beach at Mar-a-Lago, right, good luck getting a reservation where they're not going to spit and piss in your food because you fucking deserve it. 
right? Who do you think is making your food? The same people that you th wanted to throw out of the country. Why? Not because they're not American or that they don't have the proper documentation to work there, but because they're Mexican, they're Hispanic, they're black. Who knows? I mean, the, the notion that what he's doing is to further advance America as the country that we are or the country that we all hope that we are. Instead, they're just tearing it down brick by brick. But let me ask you this then. You've said that these basically white guy hate group members have been able to literally get away with the murder and the insurrection because they are white. They don't need any other disguise. They're just white. But here, any minute now, people of color and their white allies far outnumber this radical right. So what's the plan that you're aware of? If there is even one, how do we fight back without a whole lot of blood in the streets? And just in, in, in closing on this question, I've oh. often said, and I've said it to you both, I think on my earlier podcast and in private, can you imagine what the Capitol would have looked like if it wasn't white insurrectionists storming, but rather black and brown? Could you imagine? No, it would have been a bloodbath. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm glad you picked up on that because that was a, a single line in that book, which I think is critical. You know, in the military, when you're carrying out an ambush, the key is to camouflage yourself, right? Blend into the environment, use natural foliage, maneuver into a position where you can carry out your attack. Those rioters, those insurrectionists had the camouflage of white skin to where they closed, closed on their opponents, the police, to within spitting in their face distance, shouting in their face distance. But when the mass closed behind them and they were outnumbering cops, 10 20 to 1 that's when they became an inhuman mob right i had this debate with uh what's his name um ben shapiro that 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 loser right on his uh when we were on real time with bill maher and he actually tried to can to say that i was lying when i used u.s park service estimates that the rally protest the rally had forty thousand people at it I mean, Trump said it was a million, okay? Everyone else says it was 2 million. I come up with 40,000 and this guy's like, that's a lot. And I said, they estimated 40,000 at the rally, 10,000 went to the Capitol, easy, right? Any glance at the video showing down the mall, down the steps where the fighting was, and it's an easy 10,000 people, done, who were up there massing thousands upon thousands massing to break down the doors and the enter the building. I think the FBI right now is up to like 2,500 entered the building. And this guy had the nerve, and this is an important factor, reinventing history in the face of your opponent, even if it's an outright lie, is a victory to them. I had people for weeks coming at me on my Twitter feed going, Ben Shapiro, you know, spanked you. Ben Shapiro educated you. You couldn't talk to him without insult. I didn't insult him, by the way. I just said, is this what you do on your show? It sucks because he's a liar. And he, he, he believes in the lies that he's shilling. But the reality that they bragged of, of the size of the numbers of people that attacked that building, they bragged about it, right? If you flip it on its head and said there was 40,000 Antifa, they'd believe it. If you flipped it on its head again and said it was actually Patriots, they'd believe it. They live in an alternate reality, a world where Donald Trump Jr. sees every one of those people behind him that supports his father as being the tribe that will believe anything and will do anything. What did they say? Was it Voltaire? I can't remember who who said, if you can make people believe in absurdities, you can make them commit atrocities. Might not, might not have been Voltaire, somebody correct me. But we are there. We are at the point where we're teetering on the edge of atrocities. And these are the same people who believe their whiteness is the ultimate camouflage for them not to be arrested, for them to be treated well 
when they're busted. Look at it. Look at look at the opprobrium of everyone who has been arrested in relation to the January 6th riot or the, the conspiracy people who worked in the White House. They, how dare they put handcuffs on me? Michael, right. you were handcuffed and you shackles jail, shackled. These people, they believe this is not allowed to them because the law does not apply to the white tribe, even when they commit murder, sedition, and conspiracy. And that's where this is going to turn to bloodshed. Right, Malcolm, let me just begin by saying you are correct. It is Voltaire, just... um. So you know, and I don't want you to lose any sleep over it. But we have so many we have so many issues here, you know, in America with this with this nonsense that's that's going on. It's amazing because many of these people that were there attacking the Capitol probably work with somebody of color. Probably, you know, have come across somebody who's Jewish, maybe at work, maybe, you know, wherever. I don't know. And yet they there at that exact moment forgot about everything else right forgot about everything else and then decided the only thing i want the only thing i care about is to hate right and lie and make up stories because those lies those stories give them cover for actions that they know they know are improper i don't care whether they do them or not you know, they know what they're doing is wrong. They just right. don't care because it furthers some racist hate and bigotry and whatever, right? So let me ask you this then. Do you think that the 40% of 2020 voters are still firmly on the side of Trump? Be despite the big lie and the mess that he's made and that he continues to make, don't you think some Republicans just want to return to something a little more normal or are they just in the process of creating a totally new normal right as like in stranger things that show that's on television the upside down world i mean their thought tear down the democracy and replace it with you know as you suggest a dictatorship and could you fucking imagine if donald was the dictator was the vladimir putin of the united states of america do you think that trump will actually then become the candidate do you think that he'll announce to become the candidate knowing now and seeing what we're seeing you know him he doesn't care he doesn't care one bit about what the january 6th commission finds out about him i mean if given the choice i wouldn't be surprised if he would come and make statements saying i did it i don't care this is about the wave that's behind him, the people that are lifting him up, that have elevated him, the people who come and worship down at Mar-a-Lago, worship his presence, which feeds his ego. But more importantly, him as the pinnacle white, right? The pinnacle tribal chief. You know, if there were any, people often ask me, well, where do they get this from? Did they get this from the Nazis? I'm gonna tell you where they got it from, okay? They got it from two movies. All of these beliefs that you can now see people tattooed with. The movie 300 about the Spartans mm -hmm. and King Leonidas, okay, where they defy everything. Everything's an insult. Anytime you open your mouth, tonight we dine in hell. This is Sparta, all of that, you know, which, by the way, was a pedophilia, child abusing society, if you ever read a, a little bit about the Spartans, you would not be uh, using them as your ace uh, military force. Um, that's one place where they got it. And the TV show, The Vikings, they love that. I mean, the number of runic tattoos that I've seen in the last few years is off the charts. Just look at the guy who was the, uh, the QAnon shaman. He had runic tattoos all over his body. You know, Thor's, um, Thor's uh, hammer, right? Molnir was tattooed up his entire abdomen, right? The, you know, the, the symbol for Valhalla and all these other things. 
That show was about tribal dominance and the tribal chief and his hot wife, right? Putting off the, the usurpers inside the tribe. And it was all about manly, you know, warfare and conquest and, you know, and listening to your tribal gods. Those shoot two shows. And if you throw in there, you know, maybe American Sniper or Zero Dark Thirty, you know, these show or, or, or SEAL Team, where they honor, they worship, worship like icons, right? right. The Encore tactical helmet and the body armor and all that stuff. I have to wear that to stay alive in, Iraq, in, 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 in Ukraine. Okay, I don't wear that for fun. I'm not a game player. I'm not a LARPer. Like people say, I am in a war zone on a frontline combat unit where artillery is the big killer, not bullets. These people wear it to destroy democracy because they feel that if they put on SEAL Team 6's helmet and they go and they attack a capital, right. their AR-15, they have absorbed the manliness, you know, same thing with the tactical beard, right? This is what Donald Trump Jr. is doing. I shoot guns now. I go out and I shoot with Eric Greitens. Or yeah, yeah. You know, you know what's funny? It's it, that when you brought up 300, when I was watching Trump giving the speech, it reminded me so much of the scene where King Leonidas um, turns around and he goes, children, children, gather around. No retreat, right? No surrender. That is Spartan law. And by Spartan law, we will stand and fight and die, right? It reminded me so much of Trump sitting there. We will go. We will go. We will march. I will meet you there, right? I mean, it reminded me so much in, in content. Now, obviously not the same words, but it's the same I'm principle. You, I'm telling you, Mike, I believe to the bottom of my heart. Now, I'm going to be tell you, I was a little bit behind on the hearings because we had a very serious artillery incident. Uh, which hit within a hundred meter, a hundred yards of us uh, on that day. So we were all a little bit shaken. I didn't get a chance to knock down our internet. When I got back up and I heard the stories that Trump wanted to go into the well of the house, I saw it all. The doors unfolding, everything. You know that was a fact. You know he wanted to go there to be declared the king of the United States. We fought a revolution against the king and these people were going to put him up that and the article, the story about him, like a five year old fighting the Secret Service agent, you know, and I know both know that's true. His chance to be the pinnacle historical figure in the United States. He doesn't see it as a king or a dictator. It's Donald Trump being. Oh, man, no. No, 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 no. All right, you tell no, me. You tell he, him. So you're, you're, you're right on target until you said he doesn't see himself as the king. He just oh, sees sorry. himself as Donald Trump. It's to him, the terms are synonymous. The terms are synonymous. What he wants is what Vladimir Putin is. And it's why uh, he, won't, he won't say anything negative about him. And the interesting is you have guys like Elon Musk and other of these mega, mega billionaire guys who are supporting him in one way or another, right? Um, and especially those that these like 300 or so members of mar a -Largo. Um, right. The interesting thing about this is he sees himself as the king. He wants what Putin has. He The first day that he would become the autocrat, the supreme leader, the monarch, whatever name you want to give him, the first thing that he would do is exactly what Mohammed bin Salman did. He'd grab all of these thousand billionaires, the Jeff Bezoses of the world, he hates Bezos, Elon Musk, he doesn't really have a lot of regard for him either. Um, you know, and the whole group of the billionaire class and take their money. Why? Because I can. And any one of these guys that think that it's not going to happen, look, I, I called this two years before, and I'm telling you, I know what goes on inside this man's head. I know because I've seen him act in that dictatorial manner. I've had enough conversation with him where, you know, he says things that are so wacky, you almost just, we used to brush it off and laugh about it, thinking that it's just some 
crazy, stupid shit coming out of his mouth. But then when you start to see the actions of January 6th and some of the other actions that he took over the course of his four years, you turn around, you put two and two together, and it equals four. And four in this case is <laughs> king, monarch, right? Yeah. Autocrat, supreme leader. That's just, what it, that's just what it is. So let me ask you this then, because I know that you've been away have you had any chance to watch the January 6th hearings? And if you have, I'm sure you have some opinions about what we've heard so far. So do me a favor, let loose. Yeah, 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 I have had a chance to watch those hearings. I usually have to watch them. You know, we're, when I'm in, in Ukraine, I'm seven hours ahead of you. So those hearings are generally occurring somewhere around midnight, you know, late evening, midnight, uh, you know, into the middle of the night. I get up at four in the morning there, three thirty, four in the morning. And, I, you know, I look through the Twitter feeds for the highlights. And the things that struck me the most are not what most people are thinking. I, I, I think I have written quite extensively in this book about the Proud Boys, Three Percenters, Oath Keepers conspiracy. Well in advance of this committee, showing they coordinated. They had coordination meetings together all the time in the run up to January 6th. They knew full well that they were going into that building. Uh, the advanced reconnaissance, the plotting and the planning of the maps of the tunnels, knowing where each room was, and this belief that I actually said it that night on MSNBC. I was terrified that night uh, when the fighting was still going on. I said this to Joy Reid. I go, we have a term for the kind of people that I suspect or have entered that building, right? Uh, you know, a uh, murder cell. This is a team of people who have designated themselves as the judge, juries, and executioners. And while everybody else is doing a protest, these are the guys who would be walking up to congressmen and senators and shooting them in the back of the head and getting a mass murder started in that building. When they said they were hunting for Nancy Pelosi, don't doubt that for one second. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Mitt Romney, everyone there were in danger. And the one troop, the one um, Capitol Hill policeman who really did his job other than Eugene Goodman was the trooper who fired the shot in the speaker's hallway, who determined this is the last barricade between those hundreds of members of Congress and American democracy surviving. And I will kill who comes over this barrier. That guy was the only guy who committed 100% to the defense of the United States that day. And the first person to come through that glass was a former Air Force security police woman who protected aircraft with red kill circles around them, knowing what a last bastion means in their terms, which is we are allowed to shoot you. She was the one who decided she would cross that line and she paid for it with her life. That no one else died by gunfire from the police that day is a testament to the professionalism of the Capitol Hill police. It is utterly amazing. Back to your first question. Had they been I black, agree. it would have been a bloodbath. Yeah. I think they would have had to redo all the concrete. Uh, I'll tell you that because it would have been stained with blood for sure. There's no doubt in my mind. You know, let me just look as we're winding down the hour. And every time I talk to you, the hour goes by just way too fast. But I just want to follow up on this. What do you ultimately think will come out of the hearings? Now, we all can acknowledge and agree that it's going to be a historical document, kind of like the Mueller you know, uh, report, but it didn't really effectuate anything. Do you think that unwinding the finer points of the Trump coup will change the hearts and mind of these entrenched Republicans? Do you think that will, will moderates come to our side? And most importantly, Will anyone go to jail as a result of this? Because I've said it just all too many times, and I, and I hate saying it because I almost feel like I'm predicting something bad. I'm afraid that Merrick Garland is worried that the arrests might lead to another insurrection or worse. What's your opinion? Okay, you got a hat trick there. No, no, and no. 
right? No, <laughs> nothing will come of it. It'll be an interesting document historically. It could be one of the key intelligence indicators that spells the end of the American Republic. You know, um, no, it will not do anything for the Republicans and make them introspective whatsoever. In fact, it could inflame them. And no, I don't believe that Merrick Garland will do anything. If he's viewing the law as I will not, I will not enforce the law. I will not hold people accountable because they are, they are too inflammatory, right? That the law should not apply to them for the good of the common, you know, the common good of, of peace within the commonwealth. Then you do not apply the law equally. Right. A true attorney general would already have announced multiple high level investigations, announced them the way, you know, they announced it before the election in 2016. A true attorney general would have an insane task force that, by the way, some things cannot be hidden. I don't care what you impanel a grand jury against Donald Trump. Everyone's going to know about it. Right. I don't care who you are. The. That, you know, the, the guys mopping the floors in the Department of Justice uh, will be reporting that to the Washington Post. Merrick Garland is an institutionalist. And I think he is the kind of guy that is such an entrenched institutionalist, such an entrenched lawyer, that he would know, honestly, that this could, in fact, be the end of the American experiment. This November, he, he could be find himself impeached by a Republican Congress that's going to impeach the president and the vice president every week. Well, not and every week. It's going to happen. It'll happen day one. Day, day one. one. Day one, hour one, act one. And Merrick Garland will go, well, it didn't happen this way for 245 years. We've got to keep it this way. I'm the attorney general. That man needs to be fired to save I've been, America. Listen. I've, I've been I've been calling for Biden to replace him, not because he's a bad man. He's not. He's just ineffective. And it's it's just a shame. So, look, let me let me say this, Malcolm. It's really good to have you back stateside. I hope you're doing well. I hope all is going well. Um, stay safe. Good luck with the book. It's a winner. I, I certainly implore my listeners to read it. Like I said, it's fascinating and terrifying at the same time. Wish you the best, my friend. And I promise you, I need you back on here because there's so much more that's coming up. All right. I'll be back.